We've got a couple of good uh, questions here. At this point, we'll open it up for a few questions. Um, and so we'll start with Allison's question. She goes back to the stair vignette. Mm -hmm. And she says, when we do the stair vignette, does the same riser method apply where the risers are different sizes? Yes. Um, it, uh, I, I can almost guarantee you that there will be two different risers um, on the stair vignette uh, because they want to just check to see if you get it. Um, so uh, th th they will, in fact, do that. And that happens all the time. This, you, you will find it's actually pretty rare uh, if you have three heights or, or more, uh, that everything will work out perfectly. Um, you know, the first floor to the second floor uh, is probably a different riser than the second floor to the third floor. Um, if you have a building that has a lot of very similar repetition floors, you might have all the same from like the, the third to four and four to five and five to six might all be the same riser height, but that first to second is likely to be different for exactly these, the reasons that we talked about. Okay, another question here from, uh, from Devon is asking, what advice can you give in the understanding of the effects of attaching dissimilar elements to concrete? Oh man, that's a, that's a big long question. It's a really good question, but it's a big long question. Um, specific uh, metals will actually uh, dissolve in concrete. Um, and so you have to be very, very particular about it. Um, I, I, I kind of don't want to get too deep into it right now because um, I, I don't want to say the wrong thing. And I should really sort of uh, make sure I've checked up uh, recently. Um, but absolutely, there's, um, there's, this is actually true both from metal to metal and from concrete to metal. Um, that. Uh, it, there, there are situations where if I use a screw of one type and a washer of another, they will have an a, um, electrolyte uh, reaction with each other and will, one will corrode and it'll actually tear itself and, and dissolve essentially. And so you have to be very careful about uh, metal to metal, but the same situation can happen with the concrete and metals. Another thing with concrete that you have to be very careful of, uh, those of you who have done uh, like a platform construction, you may have noticed that at the top of the uh, foundation wall, before you put the sill plate down, they should always, they don't always, but they should always put a sill sealer uh, down first, which is uh, like a thin layer of kind of squishy, but, um, uh, but uh, uh, squishy material that that stops moisture from, from penetrating through. And even if you're using um, uh, pressure treated uh, wood, the concrete, like I said, there's more water in the concrete in order to make it workable than it actually needs. And so the concrete will give off actually a shocking amount of water over a span of time, especially for the first year, uh, that it'll just keep giving off water. And uh, it will rot out any wood that's right up against it. So you have to find ways to separate these things. So you'll often see uh, like these kind of fibrous elements, neoprene elements, uh, things like that that become separators between something that is being attached to the concrete, either if it's metal or wood. Um, but you should absolutely look up the specifics of which kinds of metals can touch the concrete, because a lot of them can't. Um, this is also one of the reasons why you have coatings on, on a lot of the rebar and things, is that you get the salts that go in with the waters and stuff like that, and you, you need to have coatings on there to protect that, that metal. Allison is asking, what is the ACT test again? Uh, I was joking on that one. Sorry, I should, have, <laughs> I should be careful. That was a high school test uh, um, uh, for like English or physics or something, um, just to throw you off. Michael was asking, do you, know if, in, uh, do you know how many questions you can expect on this part of the exam? Yeah, so, okay, um, one, one question, which is a similar question which I often get is, all right, how many questions do I need to answer correctly? And I always try to dissuade people from even thinking or worrying about it. Um, the, the number of questions, um, I, I forget, I should have looked it up, but it's something like 85 or something like that. It's, it's, it's around 100, a little less than that um, for uh, an exam like this. Um, but that doesn't mean that those all are questions that are going to gr grade for or against you. It's quite possible that uh, they may have realized that, um, uh, like uh, I'll give you an example. A, a few years ago, about 2007 or so, um, I, I was teaching classes on this stuff and uh, people, uh, people talked to me all the time about this, as you might imagine, and so they came back and they said, oh my God, I took the exam after we did the class and like, there were like 30 questions on sustainability. Like, what was up with that? We barely talked about it. And 
the, what had happened in that scenario was that NCARB had kind of realized that they were behind the curve on people talking about sustainability. And you know, in 2002, very few people were, uh, were, were really deep into thinking about it. But by 2007, 2008, if you weren't thinking about sustainability, you weren't talking about architecture. Like it would become very much a part of, of the discussion. And they realized they needed a lot of sustainability questions but they didn't have a lot of them already written. So they wrote a whole bunch of them and then put them into all the different exams. And then as they would go through it, they would check out if they put a question in that 100% of the people got it right, well, that question's too easy. And so they would throw it out or they'd take it, throw it out for you and then rewrite it into a different situation and put it back in. If 20% of the people got it right, well, that's too hard. They'd throw it out. Um, so there's often test questions in there. In that case, there was a whole lot of test questions going on. In, every, in any scenario, there's always going to be a few test questions, and you just don't know which ones are actually counting for, you know, are actually part of your actual exam, and which ones you're just answering test questions for them to understand. Uh, do people understand the question? Does the wording work? Does, you know, uh, uh, even if it is a reasonable question, did, you know, too, was it just too hard? Um, so uh, I wouldn't worry too much about it. The question run will be uh, somewhere about 75 or 80 that count for you, um, and you, but don't worry about it. Just answer the best you can. So we'll take two more questions here. Um, Dustin's asks, uh, when you get a submittal for a concrete mix design, they include a compressive strength test history for that mix design. Yeah. The plant provides that, but where does the testing history come from? Um, is it from cylinder tests used on previous batches, for example, other projects, or not? Um, it actually can come from two different sources. One of them is that uh, they, you know, on on bigger, more important buildings, you can imagine this stuff is watched very, very closely. Like if you're doing uh, a bigger building and uh, the compressive strength of the concrete is vitally important to a multi-floor, uh, uh, you know, structural situation. You're going to be very careful about checking these. Uh, um, you're not going to crush all of these cylinders, but you're going to check a lot of them. Um, and the different mixes, if they find that they do a mix and they they crush them and they they uh, always get back a really consistent number, then that's something that, that you know they would take that information back and they would use that in their in their uh, documentation. Um, but uh, often they'll do they'll have their own systems of like uh, the cylinder test. You actually don't go back typically. I think you do some places because there's just not enough resources out in certain parts of the country. Um, but in the in the best case scenario, you wouldn't take the cylinder back to the place you bought the concrete from. You would take it to a third party because what you want is somebody else to look at it for you. Um, so there's somebody who's not interested, and they they may not even know what the concrete. Um, mix was supposed to, what compressive strength it was supposed to get to, you actually don't want them to know. You want them just to do the test and they say, yes, it came out to 7,200 PSI or 3,000 PSI or whatever it is. Um, uh, so they, if they're doing that, they're probably using their own testing as they came up with the mix. Um, they've tested it and tested it and tested it, kind of perfect the mix, and then they'll, they'll settle on one. And so they've been testing it for themselves, but then they would be able to also check, um, because they would look at the logs of other people's tests and make sure that their numbers were the same as the other people's numbers. So it'll actually be both. Um, and it, it's partly, I'm sure, dependent on which company and which location. Okay, and then finally here from Tom, he wants to know if, if is board feet the same for, um, for actual or nominal dimensions? Um, you it can actually, uh, you must use nominal dimensions um, because like when I was doing this, this really simple one, uh, it's obviously the same uh, because there's only one board and like it, you know, it end up being very similar. Um, but uh, you can imagine that if the difference between something that's an inch and a half tall and something that's two inches tall in terms of uh, how you start adding it up, if I, and thinking of this as like a train load, that's a giant amount difference. Um, and so you'd be way, way, way off uh, if you were using the actual. So it's definitely uh, the nominal dimensions that are used for board feet. All right, uh, well, we'll end it there. So thank you, Mike. Uh, and thanks to all of you who've tuned in. If you guys would like to attend our next ARE Live broadcast, 
on the schematic design exam. Visit blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register or attend. Just like today's episode, you'll have a chance to ask questions and share your answers with Mike for live feedback during the broadcast. And that one's really different because it's about the vignettes and it has a very different flow to it. So it'll be similar, but quite different discussion. And you guys should know that ARE Live is now a podcast. So if you go to uh, blackspectacles.com slash podcast, you can actually register, or I'm sorry, you can subscribe to the podcast for uh, via iTunes or Stitcher. Um, or you can watch uh, any of these uh, video replays uh, on our YouTube channel, which you can get to also uh, from that podcast page. So you can, now you can take Airy Live with you in your phone uh, or your, uh, any device. Um, so it's, you'll have, you can have Mike in your so, ear. So now you can time. ruin your vacation anywhere. Yeah, there you right. go. <laughs> um, so, um, and then also, of course, to learn more about our AIA Airy prep curriculum, go to blackspectacles.com where you can, um, you know, prepare for the ARE uh, uh, in all seven uh, sections of the exam, including the one we covered tonight. Um, we'll put a, a, a link in the show notes. And for those of you who want to get busy preparing for the ARE, um, if you're already an AIA member, you can visit AIA.org slash ARE prep to get a 15% discount for the entire duration of your AIA ARE prep membership. Finally, please leave a comment below the video to let us know what you think and share any suggestions you may have. I promise we'll read every word that you write and use them to tune our next episodes. So thanks for watching.